All right. So this is the first edition of the Dialectic Chaos podcast, and I'm Patrick. Dialectics of Chaos, sir. No, Dialectics of Chaos is our username. Dialectic Chaos is the name of the podcast. Oh, but that's so confusing. Whatever, man. Whatever. <laughs> All right. Um, to complicate it. <laughs> so, um, we are two guys in Idiot. metal bands. Yes. And we find that we can just talk and argue indefinitely about metal. Yeah. Just on and 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 on. Um, and this is a talent which is very scarce in the modern world, I would say. Would you say? Oh, yeah. So, um, we thought it would be a good idea to record some of our more interesting discussions for the benefit of posterity. <laughs> we will enlighten you. We will make you smarter. Yeah. Will make your brain gears turn the big fast. Anyway, um, many words, too big. So, I, I guess a little bit of background. Um, I am Patrick, and I have played in a, a black metal band called Necroergica and a hardcore punk band called Mishap, and I've done actually a bunch of other musical projects. Um, I've been a metalhead since like I was 14 or so, and I'm like 23 now. I play bass, guitar, do vocals. Um, my favorite genres are black and death broadly, and my favorite band is probably Voivod. Um, I also really like Atheist, Emperor, and Rush. Um, and I know Nick from college. We have been friends since college with a rough, rough spot. In the middle there. Flexing that degree. <laughs> um, degree in philosophy. And Nick, a little background on yourself. Yeah, I'm in a thrash metal band called Mindraiser. Um, I'm the front man. Uh, we do, like, kind of, you know, pseudo old school crap, but it's a lot heavier. And there's clean vocals, which is, you know, what it is, I suppose. Uh, I'm just not a good screamer, I guess. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I, I like all sorts of metal. I, I listen to a, a really broad variety, but I think I, I, I hone in on the classics. You know, I think overwhelmingly I, I prefer the classic bands to anything else. But, you know, again, my, my taste is significantly deeper than most people you'll find, maybe just not as much as Patrick's. You know, I'd say my favorite band is Iron Maiden, followed by Megadeth and uh, Dissection. I really like Warbringer. I like Tool. I know, I'm such a Tool, right? Ha, 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 Oh, Gojira is sick, too. Love Gojira. So. I don't uh, like Voivod. Speaking of a lot of the bands we've mentioned, <laughs> <laughs> we thought a good subject for discussion at um, not so much the dawn of 2020. We're pretty far into 2020 and the disaster that is 2020. Um, but the again, Murder Hornets. Yeah, that's that's the worst part of that's what's going on hornet. right now. It's the murder hornet. <laughs> it's the murder hornets. That's why I'm not going out. That's why I'm afraid to <laughs> go, go out or whatever. But anyway, um, we thought a good topic of discussion would be our top ten of the past decade. This is not our top ten generally, even though the image on the screen just says uh, Patrick's top ten, Nick's top ten. This is not just generally our top ten. No. This is our top 10 metal albums of this decade, or this past decade, the 2010s. The ones with ones in it. Yeah. Um, so, Not the ones with twos or zeros. Though there's a zero in that one, I guess. So. Yeah, there is. It's, it's a one zero. Yeah. Um, but um, we would like to begin, I think before getting into this actual chart that we have, with some honorable mentions. So, Nick, would you yeah. like to start with yeah, your honorable can, mentions? I Just do, do them all at once. Mentions. Just do them all at once. Okay, so the first one is Forever by Code Orange. Uh, then Exercises in Futility by MGLA, however the hell you pronounce that. Guy, Gidla, you I a, think. 
you need to put a vowel in your name so we can actually say the word. MG? What the hell is an MG sound supposed to be? I think they're Polish. I think they're Polish. I'm also Polish, and I know how to put vowels in things, sir. It sucks that their album is so good. Um, (laughs) The next one is King by Flesh God Apocalypse. And uh, then Dystopia by Megadeth. And then Demon by Mayhem. I think it's Diamon. I'm not sure, though. They pronounce it Demon, sir. They oh. say it in one of the songs. Demon! You see, I can't do harsh vocals for shit. This is why I sing. Demon! Anyway, yeah, uh, Dystopia. That is some Alex Jones shit. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's such a good record. I mean, I will acknowledge that it's uh, the, the best thing Megadeth have had going in a while. But at the same time, it kind of feels like mostly like a rehash of a lot of their past greatest, you know, ideas. And you think that then you listen to it and you're like, no, it really isn't. And the other thing is, those vocals are so distracting. Like, normally I don't mind, like, crazy lyrics and off-the-wall stuff, but this is this is a little much. I mean, it's not as bad as Endgame. Well, maybe, but I didn't like Endgame. I loved Endgame. Well, okay. We're, we're not going to get into this. <laughs> I love Megadeth. I, I love early Megadeth. I love all Megadeth. I, I even like the bad Megadeth. <laughs> Did you like Super Collider? Honestly, honestly though, I, I think Super Collider had its moments. Well, everyone likes Kingmaker. Kingmaker's a great track, and and Super Collider is kind of an earworm and a guilty pleasure, I'm not going to lie. Alright. There's not much else that's memorable. The one song with the, where Dave Mustaine talks about working at the gas station, I can't for the life remember the name for it, but I actually like that song. I oh, think that's the one David Draymond's on. All right, I, I lost. I stopped paying attention, like at Super Collider, so I'm not going to argue too deeply about this. I, I'm I'm glad you didn't go down the risk rabbit hole because I would have gone on all sorts of tangents about that album. Yeah. Well, in any case, um, I guess I'll do my honorable mentions now. Um, and the first I have is Fear Inoculum by Tool, which I think is a great album. But it's a little difficult for me to listen to because it's just um, it's so long and it's not very exciting, you know. And it's not supposed to be. It, it feels kind of desperate. It shows their age in a good and effective way. But um, I don't know. It's just hard to listen to on a regular basis. Um, emptiness. Agree. Emptiness. Nothing but the whole. Which is only an honorable mention and not a top ten because I didn't want to include two uh, records from Emptiness. Um, Men Must Die, Peace Was Never an Option. I completely forgot that album existed and I did my honorable mentions, which is a shame because I listened to the crap out of that album. That album belongs in my honorable mentions too. Just just solid. Just, Just solid. I mean, it's tech death, but to me it feels more like just really extremely high grade metalcore. I hear mellow death in there. Like it feels like what Gothenburg metal could have been. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, I like Gothenburg metal, so. Yeah. Um, Black Sabbath, thirteen, which I think was just a solid comeback from them, and Black Breath, Sentence to Life, which combines elements of hardcore and like Swedish death metal, and I just really like it. It's really catchy. I've never heard that record. You should give it a go. It's it's pretty fun. Um, yeah, all right. Now, without further ado, let's let's start counting down our top ten. It's not going to be a big surprise because they're on the screen, but we'll we'll go through. I, it I actually changed surprise. mine. You changed yours <laughs> midway through, just just as we went live. I'm like, you know what? Let's just change this. <laughs> so what you're saying is this image is not accurate for you. Well, there's only there's only one change, and I just moved two around. Okay, well that's fine. All we'll right, get there, though. all right. Uh, give me your number ten and start justifying it. Okay, so my number 10 was Nightmare Logic by Power Trip. Power Trip does exactly what I want a thrash metal band to do. You know, they, they didn't reinvent anything. 
they just said, we're just going to make a thrash metal album and every single song is going to make you want to go into the mosh pit and beat your head into the wall and kill the guy next to you and shoot the mailman. That's what Nightmare Logic is to me. Nightmare Logic is the shoot the mailman album. You know, if I'm upset and I want to, you know, just beat the shit out of something or I want to drive really, really, really fast or, like I said, if I want to shoot the mailman, I put on Nightmare Logic. I can't argue with that. I, I don't and know what that, you mean by shoot that, the mailman. You, you don't need to worry about what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, again, this album is just pure, raw energy. The riffs are simple. They just beat your head in. You know, that first riff on Soul Sacrifice just sold me on the record. You know, that shit's great. It's cool that they're in standard tuning. Um, you know, they, they do everything the old-fashioned way. It's you know, just Jackson guitars and Marshall amps tuned to E standard. And, uh, you know, the, the vocalist looks like a homeless person, which I just love. And I think he intentionally dresses like a homeless person, too. Like, he's got the sweats and the long sleeve t-shirts and the baseball hat. Oh, I love, I love that guy. I don't even know his name, but I love him. I mean, I can't argue with it. It's a solid, solid album. Um, it doesn't make my top ten just because there's, you know, other things that I put ahead of it. It, it is exactly what you described. And I like that, but I don't love that. You know what I mean? Shoot the mailman. Shoot the mailman, I guess. Yeah. Uh, to be clear, we do not advocate violence against uh, people of mail. <laughs> Or this people. Is direct, by the way, this, this is all directed at a friend of mine. Just so you know, my friend. Is, my oh friend right. Is, and bandmate is a mailman or was a mailman. <laughs> and, uh, this is this is all directed towards him. Because well, I'm trying to get him to listen to Power Trip because he, he just hasn't delved into it, and I know he'd love it because he's a huge punk guy. Well, you know what? He's so trying to get you to listen to. Voivod. <laughs> He, he is not actively trying to get me to listen to Voivod. Well, he should be. He's, he's, he, he likes Voivod. He's got better taste than you, just like, <laughs> in virtue of that fact. <laughs> I don't care how much Creed he listens to. <laughs> <laughs> he does listen to Creed. <laughs> I love you, dude. <laughs> uh, anyway. All right. So I guess I'll get into my top, uh, my, my number 10 then. My number 10 is Mute Me Within, self-titled release, which I'm surprised that was not on your honorable mentions, Nick, because you listened to the shit out of that album. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I love that record. I, I found that record right when it came out. Yeah, me just, too. Just I randomly through it. iTunes recommendations. Yep, yep. same Same, same, same exact story. Same exact story. And um, I actually know people connected to that band because they're from New Jersey, which is ah, pretty cool. Okay. Oh yeah, that's 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 cool. Um, their vocalist is fucking crazy, dude. That's 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 what makes the band for me. So for those of you who don't know, which is which is going to be a lot of you, I'd imagine, um, Mutiny Within is a band that's a little hard to describe. They're they're sort of like a combination of power metal, metalcore, progressive metal little bit of elements of melodic death metal but they're just like kind of the most polished sort of sound that you can imagine and normally i don't like that kind of thing i like uh stuff that sounds kind of like a hobo was making it like uh your power trip guy um but <laughs> but with mutiny within they just executed at such a high level everything is tight polished They've got Dragon Force solos, but they're like way more catchy versions of Dragon Force solos over like melodic versions of Lamb of God riffs. I don't like these individual elements, but what really takes it to a higher level for me, I guess, and what brings it all together is the vocalist. Chris Clancy is a fucking beast. He's one of the greatest metal vocalists, like just of all time. Like he's probably in the top 10. Um, he's a fantastic singer and he's also an excellent screamer. Um, he can hold out notes like 10, 15 seconds with like extreme strength, hit highs, like soaring highs, um, very catchy choruses. The lyrics don't seem to be about anything. They're incredibly vague, but that's besides the point. Um, and I don't know. Mutiny Within is kind of like just metalhead pop 
or metalhead ear candy, but it just does it so well that uh, and there I have a lot of nostalgia for it. So it made my top ten for me. Yeah, it, it's a great record. I just uh, you know honestly when I wrote this, I, I wasn't thinking about that record because it's been a while since I've delved deep into that record. But uh, it, it's a phenomenal uh, piece of music, and I think more people should hear it. Again, it's it's very. Um, I, I think they occupy the same space as Ghost does for a lot of metalheads, except they're less cheesy and weird, and they kind of like try to legitimately take themselves seriously. Mm-hmm. Again, I, I think the comparison to Dragon Force or Camelot would be a, a great comparison. Camelot's a pretty but, good comparison. I, I think they're kind of like Camelot if. They are what Camel so Mutiny Within is to Camelot as Epica is to Nightwish. I'm not too deep into that metaphor. I don't listen to Epica or Nightwish. The different the, the here's the difference. Nightwish is like medieval stuff, and you know the lady. And, and then Epica is kind of futuristic, and they have a guy that screams. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. They're like. A couple of inches heavier. Right, right. So it's one of the Mutiny Within is one of the few things considered power metal that I could get into at all. The other ones being uh, Camelot. Yeah, Camelot's fucking great. Um, Falconer, I like, and of course uh, the mighty Blind Guardian. (laughs) I was gonna yell at you if you didn't mention Blind Guardian. Of course, I'm gonna mention Blind Guardian. Um, But anyway, let us continue. With your number nine, Nick. I chose L'Enfant Sauvage by the French metal eco-fascists Gojira. <laughs> they're not eco-fascists. <laughs> they're not eco-fascists. They're, they're just they're just eco, just eco, no fascist. <laughs> yeah, th- this album is kind of a transitional album for Gojira. Um, my, it's not my favorite Gojira album. In fact, I would say it's probably my number three favorite Gojira album. But you know, this was kind of their their big thing of the the twenty tens, and they were transitioning away from being a hardcore tech tech death band to moving a little closer to progressive metal with death metal elements. I think this album did it significantly better than their later release Magma, which went a little I think a little too far in the progressive psychedelic direction, and I think they they lost a lot of their edge. You know, it's got great cuts that are super heavy like Explosia and the Axe. And then it has a very you know, contemplative side, like uh, you know, the gift of guilt. Uh, again, it's just a, a strong, you know, intelligent album. You know, the, again, they're, they're, the thing about Gojira is they, they, their influences aren't written on their sleeves like a lot of bands are. You, know, you can tell that they're influenced by Sepultura and Death, but they're so far away from Sepultura and Death. And they're just kind of in their own space, and they they use tapping in such a unique way. Like I I don't know a lot of bands that use tapping like Gojira does. You know, the, instead of like doing tapping like Eddie Van Halen would as a solo, you know Gojira will make a whole song out of a tapping riff, and it will be just super catchy as hell, and yet still maintain the heaviness. And I, I think the biggest thing with Gojira though is their uh, their lyrics. Their lyrics are just so intelligent. You could tell you could tell the Duplantier brothers are very smart guys and uh, they genuinely care about the environmental cause and I think it's really cool that they're doing something different, you know. It's all about making beauty in a, a way that's still really fucking heavy. Yeah. So I'm not a huge fan of Gojira. I haven't heard this whole album. Um I've heard a few songs from it like um I think the, the, the title track's one of the most... Like, that's the, that's the popular one. Yeah, that's the popular one. Um, and I gotta agree that it's some of the most unique stuff out there, right? It's, it's a very original style of playing. but and, and it is catchy, but at the same time, I feel like, for me, it, it's, it's kind of... It, it's, it's weird to have a band that's supposed to be progressive, and they, they have so little... Um, change within their songs you know they've no, got the thing like is they do though it's, it's a rhythmic change though you know I, you tend to fixate on notes and you don't tend to fixate anything really on rhythm you know it's kind of the same deal we had with acdc the other day for reference we we're talking about acdc and acdc is known for playing the same few chords all over all over and over again 
but that's not where they make the difference in their riffs. The difference is in the rhythm, and that's what Gojira does. Gojira is a rhythm band, just like ACDC is. Well, maybe I need to give it a re-listen. We've been doing a thing where we're going to um, listen to... We, we have a top 100, and we're going to be listening to each other's uh, top 100 one album at a time. Or That's what we've been doing anyway. We've started that. I made him suffer through Let There Be Rock yesterday. And I made, made him suffer, suffer through Massive Attack. Oh. Massive Attack, Mezzanine. Yes. Um, but So I'll, I'll have a chance to re-listen to this and be able to reevaluate it. I haven't listened to it top to bottom, and I haven't listened to it as in-depth as you have. Um, I'm not inherently a fan, but I do see the originality is, is definitely there. The originality is definitely there, and the catchiness is there. Um, oh, yeah. So... I guess let's proceed. Um, I've got for my number nine, Craft, White Noise and Black Metal. Um, Craft gets a reputation for not being the most original band, for being like just a Dark Throne clone, essentially. And me, I see why you might say that, because they do sound a lot like Dark Throne, maybe mixed with Mayhem and all that kind of stuff. But to me, they're like what Dark Throne wants to be when they grow up. Craft, in a lot of ways, outdoes um, what Dark Throne did for me. And their riffs are very original, um, if you listen, like, attentively to them. They don't sound different, you know? There's nothing on the surface of them that sounds so radically different from what any other Dark Throne clone black metal band is doing. But the way their riffs work, they just contort in weird ways that I would not expect. And there's also like this this powerful, maybe sort of urban or futuristic vibe to it that's just very menacing. And there's a lot of moments uh, in White Noise and Black Metal where they're doing things that I had never heard anywhere else. Like the main riff of Again, for instance, that's, that's now their most popular song, I think. It's got like almost this genty beat in the background of, of a black metal um, type like arpeggio, like it, it starts going you know, over um, all these uh, augmented I think arpeggios, and there's just a lot of original songwriting and a lot of riffs that just grab you and make you headbang in like a traditional dirty. Uh, misanthropic, absolute black, you know, violent sort of way. Um, so yeah, that's my opinion of uh, White Noise and Black Metal. I've never listened to this album. I don't think I could name a single Kraft song, to be honest with you. Uh, they're, they're one of those bands that's kind of, you know, slipped under my radar. I know you've mentioned them to me a couple of times, but they, they've, again, they're one of those bands that you've mentioned to me a bunch of times I never got around to listening to. Whereas, you know, if, a few of these bands on this list you turned me on to. Um, but, you know, I'll have to give it a go. Uh, yeah. it, it sounds really interesting. However, you've also explained things that are super interesting to me, and then I listen to it like, oh my god, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, stop sleeping on crap. It's nothing, you know, so out there that you're going to think it's terrible. At worst, you won't see what the fuss is about. But at best, you will see what the fuss is about. Or Stark Throne. Yeah. Yeah, at worst you're gonna be like, this is just a Dark Throne clone. But I don't I like think you Dark will. Throne. Because it's it's not a Dark Throne clone. It's it's its own thing. It just sounds it just sounds a lot like Dark Throne. But it, it's 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 its own thing. Um Alright. Uh you next. Or, was wait. It number number eight, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just number a craft. Eight. My turn. Yes. yes. Yeah. I, I chose uh the Satanist by Behemoth. And this album, just when I first heard about Behemoth, I'm like, uh, they're just an annoying death metal band. They like to move board gear, but death metal, I want no, I have no interest in them. And then I went on my merry way and looked at other things. Then uh, one of their tracks popped up in something that I was listening to. And I'm like, wait a minute, what is this? This is pretty cool. And like, this is Behemoth? I thought they were like, boring so i delved into behemoth and uh lo and behold they were actually really good 
and uh, this particular album is their absolute best work, and I think it's miles ahead of anything they've done, uh, and perhaps anything they will do. And th- this album kind of is behemoth accepting what they are. You know, they're not a black metal band, but they're a, a death metal band that really likes black metal. And there's there's just a lot to be said for, you know, just the amount of coolness in this record. You know, they just didn't care. They just did what they wanted to do. And, you know, it's got super low-tuned guitars, and it's got great production, and it's really wide and airy and builds this wall of sound. And there's these crushing moments, like the very end of Oh Father, Oh Satan, Oh Son, that bit there. And, you know, it's just a banger. <laughs> just a banger. <laughs> so this album I am pretty intimately familiar with because I definitely loved this album for a time, um, but over time it I sort of degraded to liking it. And I think one of the things that did that for me is I heard um, like an 8-bit version of, I think, uh, what's the fourth track? The one that goes... Uh, or a Pro Nobis Luciferi? Yeah, that's right. That's the one. That's the one. That's the um, second best track in the album. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really appealing, but I feel like, you know, I, I, I often listen to 8-bit versions of metal songs, actually, because it helps me get, like, the pure... It helps me get, like, the pure music. Okay. Know? Uh, I feel like it helps me appreciate what's there in terms of, like, things that I might have missed because of distortion. Um, and in the case of Ora Por Nobis Lucifer, what, however you say it. Whatever it's called. I mean, I actually realized that the production is so much of what makes this good. It made it a little harder to listen to, you know, because I realized that they're they're sort of dressing up like something that at its core isn't as strong as the thing surrounding it. However, I will say it has some very strong moments, like oh, all of Oh Father, Oh Satan, No Son. That is extremely well executed. It's it's black metal cashmere. Who doesn't want that? Yep. Uh, it starts out strong. Freaking, I saw the virgins, God, spewing forth the snake. Uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's a fun moment. Um, and it's, it's a good album. I might put it on, on my own again at some point. And I certainly would be, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, glad to hear it again. Um, but it doesn't make my top 10 just, because well, you're just wrong. It's crowded out. Okay. Well, <laughs> no, you, <laughs> <laughs> that all you have to say about that yeah i mean it, it, i feel very similarly as i do about nightmare logic to this record it's just one of those wall of sound records which can just e- evoke movement out of out of you which is something i look for when i listen to music and uh it's just really evil and uh you know again i i don't quite see the boringness you're finding because i don't listen to 8-bit versions of songs I to ruin them for me boring i wouldn't call it boring I, I, it's, it's good. It's just not as good as it felt like initially. I mean, an album is the sum of its parts, you know? That's true. You, you can have a, a really simple riff that's nothing reinventing the wheel, and then when it comes together in the context of the band, I, I think that is great. You know, I think that's you know, a, a theme that you find with a lot of the best songs out there. Is there's something simple. There's a bunch of simple things jammed together, and that creates an amazing track. I agree that simplicity can be uh, very, very effective as a tool. But for me, you know, I I feel like uh, timbre alone is hard to get by on, especially in something like metal. But you know what? Well, again, there's more than timbre that makes that song good. Okay, okay, let's let's not go back and forth on this forever. My opinion of Power Trip and The Satanist is also the same. I consider them both quite solid. You consider them fucking fantastic so there, there's just you know again yeah. <laughs> i'm not going to argue with you about why something i like but i just don't love um i just like it <laughs> like a volt. um anyway so my number eight is vain error zone this one came out i think 2018 
So uh, I so so did uh, Craft uh, White Noise and Black Metal. So there there have been a lot of great releases actually towards the end of this decade. Um, and Vein is sort of almost tangentially related to metal. It's normally considered a hardcore type album, but so much of what's called hardcore these days is really metal, like musically speaking. Um, Arizona by Vane is sort of a mathcore thing. You could call it like Converge, but to me it's a lot more accessible than Converge, and they've got a lot of industrial vibes going on. Um, I got turned on to this album when I was at a show, and they were opening for Twitching Tongues, Ghost Main and Code Orange. I mean, opening for they were on the set list with them. Um, I had never heard anything about Vane, but the first time I saw them, I there was a crazy pit, and I moshed like crazy in it because the thing about Vane is they know exactly how to create controlled chaos. They change the tempos and the rhythms at such at, at just the right point, right to get a constant feeling of intensity there's a lot of dissonance there's a lot of industrial elements there's a lot of rapid tempo shifts there's a lot of breakdowns that start before they should or end before they should it's extremely heavy chaotic over the top and it's just a blast to listen to there's also a couple melodic moments which i think enhance enhance the mood keep the variety going doom tech in particular is an outstanding show of what you can do with a, an extremely simple motive. Because in Doom Tech, like, there's just this repeating, da da, which of course sounds like Doom Tech, right? And they just have so many variations of what they do with just a pattern of literally two notes, you know? <laughs> um, and I'm not going to act it out, but it, it reminds me, honestly, of, if anything, of like the first moment of fate you know the, the the first movement of beethoven's fifth the da, 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 where he does so many things with that one little theme uh and vain do that in doom tech with just two notes over and over again in so many different variations uh anyway yeah i'm gonna stop ranting there's there's a lot great going on in that album um it's chaotic it's dystopian it's it's great <laughs> so I listened to this album while we were getting set up to do this stream. Now, I will admit, I didn't have a chance to actively listen to it, let alone look and see what song I was listening to when I was listening to it. Um, it gave me strong Code Orange vibes, which is, you know, if you know my honorable mentions, I like Code Orange a lot. And I didn't know you saw them live. That's pretty cool. I saw them live at This Is Hardcore, but I didn't see them live at that show. I left before Code Orange because I'm not a huge Code Orange fan. Oh, I, 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 how do you like this band and not like Code Orange? They're the same thing, except they have a good thing. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. For me, Code Orange just always sounded kind of flat. Um, I, I will admit that they're good, and they have the craziest live show I've ever seen. People, like, get get carried out on stretchers on that thing, and I'm barely exaggerating. Like, I saw people with, like, bloody foreheads coming out of that thing because people go absolutely nuts when Code Orange play. And they got yeah, nominated they for a awesome. granny. <laughs> granny, not a granny. A granny? They're, they're nominated to have a grandmother? <laughs> well, I mean, that's the same thing, honestly, to me, because it's like you get this super violent, heavy punk band that is very fringe to me. And then... Somehow people are nominating that for, like, the most mainstream award thing. That's just a, a crazy measure of, like, how mainstream the hardcore scene is becoming. But they anyway. deserve it, though. They really did deserve that, that because they're, they're insanely good. But for me, Code Orange, it just didn't click. Vane did click. I feel like most people who like Code Orange would like Vane. It's that same sort of thing. But for me, no, that's, I don't that's like Code thought. Orange. I don't like Code Orange, but I do like Vane. I, I like them both, and uh, I found Code Orange pretty recently, and uh, I'm excited to getting to one of their shows, and I will probably drag you along. <laughs> You're not going to like the pit. It's it's hardcore dancing. It's not a push pit. Never mind. I'll pass. I love push pits. I hate hardcore dancing. Hardcore dancing just does not make any sense to me at all. I prefer push pits, but I... Push pits I, are so much fun. Push pits are a lot more fun. 
But, they don't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> well, they hurt true. a little bit. They hurt a little bit, but it, they, they don't, like, it's not stupid. You're not getting it punched in the face. doesn't ruin your day. <laughs> yeah, well, to me, a pit is a pit, you know, at the end of the day. I, 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 I will much prefer a push pit, but at the end of the day, I'll mosh. When we, when we had a, our, our third mosh pit we ever had, there was a guy hardcore dancing <laughs> for my band. And I looked at this guy. I looked at my bandmates. I'm like, what a jerk off. And I made fun of him in the next, in the next lineup. Well, you got people hardcore dancing? <laughs> That's how I feel about hardcore dancing. I make fun of it. It was, it was all in good, good fun and love. I wasn't like being a jerk or anything like that. But like, I had to, I had to make a joke. That's just my, my personality. Yep, yep. All right, let's proceed to your number seven. That would be Emperor of Sand by Mastodon. Um, this is one I share with a lot of people in the metal movement. You know, I know Corey Taylor loves this album. Despite what you might think about Corey Taylor, he apparently has decent taste. Um, th- this is kind of Mastodon's... Uh, finding themselves or we found ourselves album you know and i I know you're not a big mastodon fan pat but uh you know they they they've gone through tons of different styles they've never put out an album that was the same sound you know the first two albums were really sludgy but they were different kinds of sludgy um and they're fantastic you know then their next two albums were super progressive and out there then they put out two like arena rock albums and Emperor of Sand kind of just said, okay, we've explored our range, and now we can do everything in one place. You know, they've got a sludgy song like Andromeda. They've got, like, space rock stuff um, in, like, you know, Ancient Kingdoms and Roots Remain. They've got, like, a, an arena rock song in, in um, Show Yourself. That's the name of the song. Yeah. And they've got like a, a top tier progressive track in Jaguar God, which I will attest Jaguar God has the best intro of any progressive metal song I can think of off the top of my head. And it's insane because their, their least talented vocalist, which isn't saying he's not talented, but their least talented vocalist is the one who sings it. And that just blows me away. Uh, yeah, it's just... Uh, a trip of an album. Every song is completely different, yet feels cohesive. Uh, the concept of the album is really interesting. Um, you know, the the metaphor for cancer is pretty obvious. Uh, it's it's a depressing record, but it's an enlightening record. You know, they they do that signature Mastodon thing where they incorporate like country guitar and somehow make it metal. Like, they're, like the, their guitarist, Brent Hines, is a country guy, so he likes to do all the chicken-picking stuff. And they, they've really incorporated that into their sound and made it cool, which is something I never thought I would say, because I, I hate country music. So you know, he almost plays the guitar like a banjo sometimes. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. But you like bluegrass, don't you? I do like some bluegrass, yeah, because I, I like banjo solos. Banjo solos are awesome. Yeah, I like bluegrass, too. Um, anyway, so, yeah, I've never heard anything from this album. And I've showed I, you stuff from this album before. Oh, well, then I guess I have heard something from this album, but I, I didn't know it was from this album. Mastodon, generally, I can't put my finger on what it is that doesn't strike me about them. But, like... They're popular. The, the riffs... No, the riffs don't kick my ass. You know who I like that's popular? Metallica. You know who I like that's popular? Foo Fighters. I love Foo Fighters, you know? Um... I, I think Slipknot have some good tracks, but Mastodon, they just um, they just don't kick my ass, you know? Those riffs just don't hit me for whatever reason. And I'll, I'll give this album, of course, uh, a spin when I'm going through, you know, more into your top 100. But um, Mastodon, for whatever reason, has just never punched me in the face with their riffs. They, they just don't hit me hard. They're not really a, much of a hard-hitting band. You know, they they have some moments where they're really hard-hitting. Again, you know, like uh, I, I think on uh, Blood Mountain or on Leviathan, I think they're really hard-hitting. And Remission, I mean, Remission's a, a sludge metal album. So Remission might even be just a beat-down album in some parts. So, well, in my mind, 
metal's got to hit you hard. That's what makes it metal. If it's not, then why isn't it just rock or something? Well, you know, there's, a, there's a lot to say about Mastodon moving in more of a rock-like direction, but they're still heavy enough to be considered metal. I mean, again, the Andromeda riff is way more dissonant than anything Metallica has ever done. Yeah, so, so maybe I need to approach it from less of a, this is a metal record, and more like, treat it like it's a rock record and, and see it on its own terms. I, I listen to Mastodon like you would listen to Rush or King Crimson. Mm-hmm. Or Neurosis, something like that. All right, all right. Again, I, I think of them as a prog band, more over anything else, but it's prog metal. You know, mm-hmm. there's definitely metal in Mastodon music. Oh, not to mention, they have one of the best drummers in the world. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Um, let us move on then to my number seven, Warbringer, Empire's Collapse. This album, I mean, everything you want in the Thrash album is supposed to be Power Trip, or actually maybe Woe to the Vanquish because you have that higher. But um, everything I want in a Thrash album, like a straight-up Thrash album, is an empire's collapse and what i want i want extreme aggression i want weird fuckery i want them to go into like black metal doom metal industrial metal i want them to have melody every now and again but not overwhelm it with cheesy melodies but just you know have them there because i think that like a few sparsely placed melodies in extreme metal music like it's sort of like an emotional climax, you know, in the middle of, of a much darker, darker point. So, and just top to bottom, they, they just outdo themselves on Empire's Collapse, Warbringer. Um, definitely, like, overall, probably the most consistently high quality of the Neo Thrash guys, in my opinion. Um, Absolutely. And um, in Empire's Collapse... They got members of Mantic Ritual, which is a obs- pretty obscure neo thrash band that I personally feel super attached to, and I think they vastly improved the quality of, of Warbringer's music, which I've been following for a long time, and I just always enjoy. Um, Empire's Collapse is just a balanced album with everything you could want. You know, <laughs> it's just a balanced smorgasbord of all the great things that an aggressive thrash band can be. And it's, it's just straight up really, really listenable. Really great album. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I'm going to just drop what my number six is here because my number six is a Warbringer album. My, my number six is Woe to the Vanquished by Warbringer. And it narrowly beat out Empire's Collapse. And I'll get there in a moment. Um, yeah, I, I want to preface this with Warbringer is, has, is becoming my like number three favorite band. They've just kind of exploded. Uh, I had the privilege of playing a show with them. I mean, you, know, you, you were there, obviously. Yeah, yeah, great show. It was a uh, you know uh, a humbling moment because they're absolutely amazing, and they're they're just the fact that they're still playing shows with bands like mine is kind of even disappointing. Because they should be way bigger than they are. <laughs> yeah, really. this is true. Now, the, re- the reason why I did not include Empire's Collapse is really simple. I think there are a few tracks in Empire's Collapse that are just pretty unmemorable. Empire's Collapse has... The, the high points of Empire's Collapse are better than the high points on Woe to the Vanquished. But the low points on Woe to the Vanquished are significantly higher than the low points on Empire's Collapse. I think most Warbringer fans feel the same way. Okay, so Woe to the Vanquished. To me, I, again, I, I, I said this before to you, um, I've only listened to it top to bottom once. I've listened to some other songs from it more than once. But it felt like a step back for me. It felt like they were going back into familiar Warbringer territory for the most part. And well, that's because their main songwriter out. wasn't in the band on Empire's Collapse, and their main songwriter came back on Witch of the Vanquished. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say to that. Maybe the, their main songwriter needs to take some cues from the other guys. Um, uh, Witch of the Vanquished is a good album, also. Um, but 
I think it only had a few standout tracks for me, like Remain Violent and uh, Divinity of Flesh. Um, Divinity and, of the Flesh is the low point of the album. How? Divinity of Flesh is great. It's nah. it's a vector ripoff. <laughs> That's, what, that's why it's the low point. They were just trying to rip off the <laughs> that, that one second where the, where the freaking goes, ah, with that stupid high voice. I mean, he managed to pull it off. He managed to perfectly like imitate whatever Dave DeSanto is doing, yeah. uh, which is impressive. for To be a guy who's got as unique a voice as John Keevil, and then to imitate another guy perfectly who's got just as unique of a voice. Um, John Keevil's got the best voice in thrash metal. Just hands down. It's it's like him and Chuck Billy. Yeah, Chuck Billy's got to be higher for me. Chuck Billy's no way. John incredible, Keeble. absolute incredible. Chuck Billy's great, dude. He's I mean, really good. To to have that aggressive of a voice and to be able to do melody with it, and it's so polished sounding. It's just so thrashy. That it's it's got to be that it's got to be Chuck. Uh, it's it's got to be Chuck Billy. Um, he is from Testament, for those who do not know. Yes. And I'm not even a huge Testament fan. I respect the shit out of the Testament, but, like, I do not listen to Testament regularly. But Chuck so, Billy is fantastic as a vocalist. Um, I would like to jump back on to Woe to the Vanquished for a moment, yeah. though. So, Woe to the Vanquished, um, just, again, f- for me, feels just strong top to bottom. There's not really a dull moment. I don't th- there's not a song on this album, like, I want to skip. Where on Empire's Collapse, while Count, uh, um, uh, Horizon and uh, Scars Remain and uh, The Serpent, those are all better than anything on Woe to the Vanquished. Just outright better. You know, they're better tracks. You know, they, they have those crazy little melodic things at the end, and they're just really kind of wild. Um, the songs on Woe to the Vanquished there's never a moment where I want to switch, skip to the next song. Every song feels unique. Every song feels strong. And another problem I have with Empire's Collapse is every single song's best moment is at the end of the song where they stop playing thrash metal (laughs) and just start playing black metal. (laughs) They just become a super melodic black gaze band for a couple of minutes. And I'm going to be honest with you. Here's the thing, though. That is, like, my absolute favorite thing they do. That is what I like doing. My, my band is Warbringer with more of that. But that particular album, every single good song has it. And it's always in the same place for about the same length of time. No, it's not true. And not every song has it. It's just that the ones that don't have it... The good just... ones do! <laughs> well, uh, not, not Turning of the Gears. Okay, Turning of the Gears does not have it, nor does Hunter Seeker. And, but the, and, the, the peaks, again, Tower of the Serpent, Horizon, yes, the best songs Stars have Remain, those the best three songs. songs are so much better than anything else Warbringer has ever done. Also, Iron City has that same kind of moment, and yeah. Um, but, yeah what to the Vanquished were... does not. What to the Vanquished has Silhouettes. Silhouettes is one of the most unique opening songs I could think of. And it, it sort of has that crazy melodic moment towards the end, except instead of being, you know, black metal y and tremolo picking with, you know, melody and counter melody, it's letting Keeble's vocals take over and have these weird vocal hooks with a more simple backseat guitar sound and, you know, mostly just drums that kind of evokes the same feeling, but does it in a completely different way, which I actually thought was a step forward for Warbringer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Woe to the Vanquished remain vi- Woe to the Vanquished is just a typical Warbringer song. I just think it's a better version of Hunter Seeker. If I had to pick Hunter Seeker or Woe to the Vanquished, I'd pick Woe to the Vanquished. Um, same type of song. Remain Violent is just a banger. Remain Violent is a fucking banger, and that that's, that's a, a hard that's a hardcore song, is what that is. That that <laughs> is <laughs> that is <laughs> open up this fucking door. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's that kind of it's that kind of song. Um, so, so Shellfire is one of the the less memorable moments in the album, but still a strong song. Descending Blade, Descending Blade. When I saw it on the set list, I'm like, why are they playing that? 
then I'm like, wait a minute, this song's really cool. Because this song, again, does what, where I think this was an evolution for Warbringer. You know, they, they tried to incorporate their, their classic, you know, living weapon type of sound, but they also brought in that melodic element they had on Empire's Collapse, but instead of sticking it on the end of the song, they shoved it in the middle. That simple digestible melody, they just made it darker. Spectral Asylum is a black metal song. Okay, so and where the when the guns fell silent. Okay, we can't talk the track. entire screen stream about Warbringer, especially because like how many people have even heard Warbringer? It's Go a, it's listen to Warbringer. Go listen to, Go Warbringer. listen to Warbringer. It's exactly what the name sounds like. It is the most appropriately named band possibly ever. <laughs> it's it's it sounds like they bring war. Um, but the gun spell silent is so good. Okay, but we we can't talk this entire stream about how great Warbringer is. Unfortunately, we'll do that later. <laughs> we'll we'll set up an entire stream where we just enthuse about Warbringer. Um, we can do that. <laughs> but for now I guess since we covered your six along with my seven let's proceed to what is my six and I guess your five so I guess we'll talk about that at the same time I guess. Sorcia de Glass ST now if you thought that Warbringer was underrated oh boy oh nailed <laughs> Sorcia de Glass is a black metal band from Quebec. It's just two guys, I think, so it's entirely a studio project, to my I have understanding. No clue. Uh, to my understanding. Um, and they've been around since like the late 90s. Um, they play a sort of, a style, sort of, I guess it's most like Emperor than yep. like if I compare it to anything else. Well, but, it's, it's Emperor without the ha! Yeah, and instead of that ha, they have this eerie sort of less distorted do you know what's going on with the guitar they have in the front well what i think they're doing is that they're they, there's definitely two guitar parts and I, I actually think they're kind of doing like what jan nodvai in dissection would do or the guy or, or the guys in uh megala whatever the fuck it is do you know they they have a the, there's two distinct guitar parts guitar one's part is melody and there's probably some overdubbing there to get harmonies and chord stuff and then there's guitar two which is just wall of sound where it's just tremolo picking chords over and over and over again to keep everything sounding big right. and then the the other part is the the, the melody so it's you know there's counter melody guy and there's there's melody guy mm -hmm. and so, I, again they just do it so well you know who else does a, sort of a similar thing i think edge of sanity yeah i think so yeah, I I don't know if that's that that might be like a distorted bass going down on there or something. There's 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 definitely like a higher, more melodic type type of thing, and then a wall of sound, like a chordal bottom on it. So it winds up sounding the wall, like the wall of sound is is just guitar. So it winds and, up, and there's bass underneath. Right. So it winds up sounding almost like like a classical accompaniment and main melody type thing. Actually, yeah. is what it sounds like, and um, it's so haunting you know they've they've got a lot of different parts actually in in this particular album and in general they, there's plenty of variety in sorcia de glass they go C from we, like let's specify this is an album that is 50 minutes long oh right there's only one song right i forgot to mention yeah this is a 50 minute long track basically it's a 50 minute long single track it's um, on spotify as a single not an album yes and it is brilliant I think the, the bread and butter of Sorcia de Glace is held in between like this sort of eerie, uh, spooky, haunting type thing, and then folk melodies that just grab you, and they're, they're so catchy and emotional at the same time, and they seamlessly blend those together. But Sorcia de Glace in this album have even more elements, things that they wouldn't expect from Sorcia de Glace. They've got, they've got a moment that's just thrashy, as how all hell the dump yeah. right and then later they've got this winding passage that goes goes all over the place and um just like a long extended chord progression and then soon after that 
They've got, you know, acoustic parts and just haunting, um, haunting, melodic, quiet, very quiet moments. There's some very quiet, somber moments on this album. And then out of nowhere, out of this just, you know, quiet, um, haunting, depressing thing, suddenly there's the most upbeat, like, folk metal. Hey! It's great. It's all over the place. In yeah, the it's most, got everything. It's, it's got everything. It's so coherent. But what dominates is indeed these these sort of cold, distant melodies that just, they, they stick with you, man. So, so you, you touched upon most of the stuff I would say that I liked about this record. But what I will add is I think this band is a great place to jump into black metal, real black metal, not like you know, Borg Gear, Cradle of Filth and Garbage like that. This is a great place to jump into real black metal because it doesn't have that potato production. I, I think if I had started with Sorcerer to Glass listening to black metal, I think I would have gotten into it way quicker than if I had started where I did, which was Dissection, which, by the way, is one of my favorite bands. We'll just drop that again. Um, but yeah, I, I think this particular record, while it's very difficult to digest because of how it's just an hour-long song, it's just you know, a great jumping in point. And, and maybe this record wouldn't be the place to start if you've never listened to Black Metal before. But again, this band in general, the production seamless. And for some reason, they just have the best snare drum in extreme metal. You should start with uh, Snowland, the, the remix of Snowland. Yeah. Because the, the early Snowland. Snowland, they re-recorded Snowland, and it's actually great. Re-recordings are normally not great, but Snowland, uh, the Roman numer numerals for 2012, it's a great re-recording. It's just fantastic production. That's the one I listened to. Yeah, it's it's just a fantastic reproduction of like the original. Like the original just had bad production because they didn't have the resources. They recreated it with the resources and made the best possible version of their first album, Snowland. And Snowland's a fantastic place to start. Even I would agree for black metal in general, it's very representative of what black metal can do while being accessible for new listeners. It sounds great. It's got moments that are slow, it's got moments that are fast, it's got intensity and eeriness, but it's also got melody. It does a unique thing, though, too, with, like, the weird winding, folky... It, it's very Quebec, you know? It, it's very, very Quebec. I mean, not just because they're singing in fucking French half the time, but... Oui, oui, monsieur. Oh, sorcier de classe. <laughs> which means ice wizard it means wizard of ices yes um yeah i love quebec metal <laughs> i love a lot of, of of metal bands from quebec i have um, strong opinions about canada <laughs> he thinks they he thinks they need to go why do they why do you why do they need to go <laughs> justin trudeau's a dunderhead I thought it was just because they had it too good for too now long. Now I have a real reason to dislike them. <laughs> <laughs> he used to just dislike them because they had it too good for too long. Well, now Justin and Trudeau shit the bed. Now I, got, now I have a justification for these opinions. All right. Well, anyway, I guess that wraps it up for Socia de Glass. Uh, so th that's my four now, right? Uh, no. Uh, wait. Hold on. So, no, because I'm, I'm still up to my fifth. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I've got emptiness, not for music. Um, didn't you have nothing but the hole in your honorable mentions? Is that right? Um, I, I, I omitted it from my honorable mentions, but it's another album that belongs in the honorable mentions. Just yes. a great record. So, Nothing But The Hole is the previous album from this band, who, little background... They started as a death metal band, <laughs> and now it's very hard to describe what they're doing. They slowly evolved towards industrial, a little bit of black metal, and now like... Pretty black metal. Yeah, but now it's got like twinges of... They don't do the black metal vocals, though. It's low pitch, and there's some serious death metal riffs. But, but it's evolved into something like ambient, post-punk, gothic rock even... It's very strange and unnerving. It, it's it's very just a weird, dark, surreal atmosphere. And there's not many moments where um, it's just over the top, um, 
but it, it's it's just unsettling. Um, I don't know if you've heard Not For Music. You've heard Nothing But The Hole. Nothing But The I, Hole. Yeah, I've heard one track from Not For Music, but I've heard all of Nothing But The Hole multiple times. So Nothing But The Hole, um, their album before this, uh, which I think I put in my honorable mentions. Didn't I do that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, because it's it's very narrow between Nothing But The Hole and uh, Not For Music. But Nothing But The Hole is basically a metal album that does some a lot of weird shit. Um, Not For Music is the reverse. <laughs> it is weird stuff that occasionally goes into extreme metal. And that's so strange and fascinating to me that you can have something which is basically not dominantly metal. Basically... It's some sort of post-punk or gothic rock or ambient or electronic in a, in a very strange way. Um, but then goes into moments and influences of really dark metal. Um, and it plods along in this dissonant way, um, mocking everything it is to be human, if anything. Like, I remember in an interview, uh, there's this one moment where, they, like, he said something along the lines of, it makes you wonder whether love is just a trick you pull on yourself to keep keep you reproducing you know it's like the, that kind of creepy shit it's, it's that kind of i guess nihilistic surreal sort of vibe um i'm a big fan of the horror of thomas ligotti which is sort of lovecraftian sort of kafka-esque kind of writer um it's it's a philosophical uh, horror, the dread of like a nihilistic outlook, or of being controlled by some like being a puppet in a deterministic way, that kind of thing. And I think that emptiness really captures that vibe. And they're doing something that no one else has done before. It's uncategorizable, and it's very effective. So. I feel like I went into a lot of weird places, and I can't fully describe what's going on here, but I tried. <laughs> emptiness is cool. Uh, I, I would say that emptiness is the opposite of Sorcerer de Glass. If you're going into some sort of extreme metal and weirdness, they are not the place to start. <laughs> but it's cool nonetheless, and it's an ac acquired taste for sure. I would recommend nothing but the whole to new listeners first before uh, not for music. <laughs> um, but yeah, good stuff. Okay. So um, now you're number four. Okay. So I put Fear and Oculum here by Tool. So um, I, I, I see Fear and Oculum as the end point for Tool's progression. And it, each of their albums, you know, kind of explores their mindset through age. You know, Enema is pseudo teenage angst or like, you know, post adolescent angst. You know, they're they're very angry at the world. It's very nineteen nineties. You know, this is you know in the grunge era, but we're better than grunge type of angst. Lateralis, they've become more contemplative. It's kind of the the post college grad era of Tool, where you know they're not so angsty, but there's things that they're thinking about that brings out great emotion in them, and that emotion is very strong. Then you know as they progress further, you get Ten Thousand Days, which is a depressing album, and you know they're 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 sad. You know, it's kind of their midlife crisis type of album, which it's sadness, but that also brings forth anger. And Fear Inoculum is Tool evolving, effectively accepting death. That's really what the album's about. It's accepting getting old. It's accepting aging and the fear of death, which is why it's not an angry album. It, you know, a lot of people got mad at Tool for this record because it's so not heady. And it's not not heavy. I mean, there's moments like on Invincible, we get head banging. You know, uh, Tempest is you know a big moment. Even the title track has some moments of, of heaviness. But again, it's it's a contemplative album about acceptance. And 
you know, I will admit there there's a lot of long songs on the album, but I don't find them as difficult to listen to. Um, you know, I, I can sit, I, I have a high tolerance for long songs. In fact, I prefer long songs most of the time. So I can sit there and listen to a couple tracks off that album in a playlist, no problem. But it, again, you know, I, I think it's one of Tool's finer works. You know, it wasn't a disappointment whatsoever. I think they took their time and they, they made a great album. I actually just, you know, absolutely agree despite not uh, having it on my top 10. Uh, I, I did put it in my honorable mentions, I believe. Um, I think the thing about it is, like I said earlier, it's a little hard to listen to. It's it's a little bit difficult for me to sit down and listen to it because it's not that metal album. It, it, it's, it's kind of painful to watch them age, and I think that's supposed to be the point. But, you know, when do I listen to it, you know? In the car. I guess, yeah. That's why I listen to it. But it, it really does what you're saying it's it's doing. It is so much an album about aging and aging with grace. And I would like to add, I, I think there's some social commentary, though, too, at the same time. Because we live in sort of an age of desperation where it feels yeah. hard to change things, where it feels like we're not in control. And Tool addressed that through the lens also of aging, you know, that sort of desperation. And so uh, dealing with this desperation and trying to wake up and make the most of the situation that you're in is also a very heavy theme of Fear Inoculum. And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great album. I, it's People can say it's boring or it's the same thing over and over again. And they're, they're like, it's similar to Tool. It's not really. It's kind of just a logical progression from where they've been going. They started like an alt metal band. And then they turned to progressive metal, and now they're basically a progressive rock band. Um, it's still pretty metal. It's got some metal in it, but I, I think this is this is just really well done for them. And I don't think that they're just rehashing their old formula. And it's definitely the opposite of that. It's an yeah. evolution. Yeah. But there's no rehashing at all. It's a logical evolution for them, and. In fact, I think if there were a song like Ticks and Leeches on this record, then I would say they're rehashing their old stuff. Right, right. But, you know, it's also hard to listen to Maynard never get angry the entire time. <laughs> well, you know, uh, he's the kind of not angry old anymore. person that's not angry. Yeah, he's, he's not angry kind of anymore. accepted his lot in life, and I think maybe he's, I think Invincible is the most powerful track on that record. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, it's clear that that's about Maynard. Yeah. Because he, he is a veteran, and he's struggling to remain relevant. Right. That, that, that You feel that. You, you can feel yeah. that right there. Okay. Uh, so, just that's all I got. One second. He's going to go yell at his roommate. Yeah. Keeps walking through the shot. All right, let us return. Okay, okay, so you're number four, right? Yes, my number four. Voivod, The Wake. <laughs> you're exaggerating how much you dislike Voivod. I don't dislike Voivod, but I'm gonna. <laughs> but that's gonna be a, an ongoing joke in this uh, in this podcast. I'm just gonna shit on Voivod nonstop. Because Voivod's my favorite band, and uh, Nick has really tried to get into them, and he is. He's really so struggled, hard. struggled to, to to get into them, and uh, we could go on about it, but I'd, I'd rather not right now. Um, but Voivod, right? They've been around a long time. They have switched their sound a long time, um, but always kept what's made them uh, Voivod. You know, those elements of dissonant chords and bluesy solos, that sort of punk twinge to it the sci-fi, all of that has remained, even though they've changed their style constantly from like speed metal to thrash to prog to sort of alternative space rock or something like that to industrial metal to like just a weird heavy metal band and then back to thrash. And um, the core element of Voivod originally was the guitar playing of Piggy, but Piggy... Um, has passed away and um, of, of cancer uh, too young 
it's a it's it's a real loss. I was not a fan of them at the time, so I did not remember. I was not aware of it. But um, you'd think, honestly, that that would be the end of Voivod because he was so integral to their sound. But they got basically their biggest fan, um, a guy who now goes by Ch uh, Chewy. I think his name is Daniel Morgrain. I, I can't. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that exactly correctly. Um, but he was a guy from a tech death band called Martyr, and he was Voivod's basically biggest fan, and he's a fantastic guitarist. Um, and they got him to uh, replace Piggy in the lineup, and they released Target Earth, which was, the production was terrible, it was the main issue with Target Earth, uh, but overall it was a good album. Um, Post Society, where they stopped doing the old, like, progressive thrash thing that they were trying to revive with the with target earth and pull in a more spaced out strange almost indie vibe you know it's very melancholic and then the wake took it in a direction which i initially was not too impressed with but as i listened to it more and more i realized that there, it's just it just cuts so deep there's so much going on in the wake it feels almost like like a, a like a bella bartek like sweet or something like that like Bela Bartok the uh, Hungarian composer he composed very dissonant complicated constantly moving um, pieces and Voivod are something similar um, it's a concept album about basically the collapse of society um, through the revealing of something maybe aliens that were under the sea it's actually very prophetic now that we're in a, a global pandemic, like I can listen to orb confusion about like the world not knowing what to do and everyone being in a panic. And I'm like, huh, <laughs> that's what, that's what's going on right now. Um, but it's a, a complicated dissonant tour de force, de force with like so many twists and turns so much going on at, 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 at a nitty-gritty level and the overall impression you get from it is just kind of oppressively dark <laughs> um yeah that's what i've got to say about the wake i like bella bartok voivod so you know again i i will crap on voivod relentlessly um i i think they're they're a, a great band they're just never really able to click with me they have a handful of songs that i think are really good to be honest the wake isn't an album that i've given much of a listen to i've heard a couple of tracks from it it's a fine record from them you know that's all i got <laughs> i don't have much to say about this particular record well it happens but it exists <laughs> the wake honestly you get into different voivod first it's it's a deep cut album it's 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 not one that's easy to uh to uh, vibe with or anything like that. You you really have to sort of understand the pre-existing Voivod language before you can see what they're doing with it. Um, yeah, you've got to know what Voivod is to appreciate that type of album. And it's such an acquired taste, dude. It's 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 such an acquired taste. Um, so, but Voivod's really worth getting into, um, in my opinion. Um, Nah. Once you sit, sit through them enough times, that Once you they sit through all through. the shit and find the diamond and the pile of doo doo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay then. Listen to Nothing Face. Listen to Nothing Face several times, and hopefully you'll get it eventually, <laughs> and then you can start working through the rest of what they have. Um. Anyway, let's move on. We have our top three, which are the same, just in a different order. And I've uh, reordered my top three. <laughs> oh, you've reordered your top three, so it's not the I'm top sorry, three. I, reordered, I, I reordered my top two. Oh, you've reordered your top two, so that makes us even closer. Um, yeah. So I guess we're going to have to talk about them at the same time. Um, I guess we'll just start with your number three and my number two. Okay, which let's is start with The Final Frontier. The Final Frontier. So I think both of us are a little biased towards this album. Because we started listening to, to metal around the time this album came out, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's 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 true. That's correct. However, 
Go on. How, however, I wasn't really listening to The Final Frontier when it was coming out, is the thing. Yeah, I mean, I listened to okay. El Dorado. I listened to El Dorado, but I never got into the big, big like, far into the deep cuts. Oh, oh okay. Well, let, let me tell my story then. Okay. So, um, I, I found Iron Maiden, like, two months before this came out. And I'm like, Iron Maiden's awesome, this band is great. And then I hear this album drop, and I'm like, it's gold mine. And I just delved deep into it and didn't realize what I had. I just thought it was a good Iron Maiden record. And then, you know, revisiting it ten years later, um, I just, you know, gave it a couple of more listens. There, there was a week, a couple of weeks ago, where I just listened to this album on repeat, over and over and over again. There's just so much there. People complained about this record because, you know, they had the Talisman, I, uh, Isle of Avalon, and When the Wild Wind Blows, which were just too long, in their opinion. They're wrong. <laughs> Those songs are amazing. Those songs are the best on the album. The, Those... the Talisman is to die for. I, mean, I, I am... I, that's one of my favorite songs, to just play on guitar. You know, I'm trying to persuade my bandmates to learn that track. Where the Wild Wind Blows, dude. Yeah, it's yeah, just I mean, it's just an artistic masterpiece. It, there, there's there's yeah, it, it's 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 everything you know. It's the entire human. Does the entire human experience come down to this? Wiped out in like a nuclear explosion. Normally, when we think about like nuclear war and we talk about it in metal, it's you know very hyped up, very uh, terror aggression. But the way they can just show the sadness of the situation. You know, bring out that element of it, um, and how our, our humanity would come out in a situation like that. It's it's just a masterpiece lyrically and musically. They they, they intertwine so deeply. Bruce Dickinson's performance throughout the whole thing is incredible. Wasn't he recovering from cancer like right before that? No, this was before he got cancer. That but, was uh, the Book of Souls. But, you know, yeah, um, for me, my story is, I listen to Eldorado a little bit, but ultimately I just couldn't be bothered to give the proper listening to it because it's so long, and there's so many long tracks on it. Um, but ultimately I came back to it, I don't remember when, but I came back to it in full maybe this past year, and I realized, top to bottom, this album is flawless. You know, Absolutely. Not, there's, not a dull moment. There's Exactly. There's not a dull moment in its <laughs> immense span. What's and the weakest as, track on the album? Uh, the Man Who Would Be King. What? <laughs> no! Well, what are you going to say? What do you oh, have? El Dorado. <laughs> El Dorado is amazing! The single is the, the weakest track of the album. That's <laughs> saying something. Because the single is really good. El Dorado is fantastic. Like, El Dorado's better than The Trooper. <laughs> El Dorado's better than Run to the Hills. <laughs> El Dorado is great, dude. No, 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 all right, well, well, we'll agree to disagree there. But the thing about The Final Frontier is they made it like it was going to be their last album. Yeah. And it shows. Like, it's it's such a proper send-off to an, an incredible career, you know? I'm so glad it isn't their last album, though. I really am. I yeah. love Iron Maiden, and I just, I just want more. So much more. <laughs> Iron Maiden's my all-time favorite band. I, I don't think there's any band in the world that is better than Iron Maiden. I, I think they're just put on the best live shows. They do anything and everything. They're not the heaviest thing in the world. Who the hell cares? You, you can still headbang to a bunch of their tracks. You know, gotcha. and, and The Book of Souls was a, a decline, but you know, uh, there's, Dance of Death was a decline too, and Dance of Death was still great. You know, it's it's hard to not decline once you've made the final frontier. <laughs> but um, you know, the moment when I realized that this album was as good as it was was when I realized how good Coming Home was. 
because coming home, the guitar solo alone. Right. The first like few times I'd listened to this album, I thought, okay, coming home, this is where the album starts to get boring. But then I realized that coming home is just so passionate, and yeah. it, it's amazing. That opening riff is just. It feels refreshing. It feels like you're flying, which is exactly what it is. It just feels free. And then the vocals, you can just really feel uh, Bruce Dickinson's passion for for um, aviation for, for aviation in it. And you feel, you know, like you're soaring over the world. Um, just a lonely satellite, a speck of dust in cosmic sand. You know, yeah. that, that thing. And it's just so sentimental and feel good um I, I didn't feel that way about coming home when i first heard it i thought coming home was spectacular that was my favorite track on the album for the longest time and looking back on it you know I, i'm way way too educated on iron maiden i i know i i could dissect almost every single one of the tracks and go into great detail what i love about this song is it kind of did what the last track on brave new world was trying to do the thin line between love and hate which is my favorite track on that record they were, but they, they did it in a more condensed point. You know, it was trying to show the other side of Bruce Dickinson singing, his ability to be melancholic and also emotional, and you know he does, he doesn't have to belt all the time. Uh, but the songwriting is just a little stronger. Uh, and, you know, it's just all around a great track, and and, and this album is super good. Yeah. If, I, if you don't dig it, you're stupid. Yeah, yeah. and we, we can't, can't we can't, can't praise it as much as, much as it's due because, because then we'd be here two more hours. hours. <laughs> yeah, <pretty much. laughs> um, so the next one. Well, the, the next, next one, one for you, I guess, guess since you switched, switched them around, is Ghost Meliora. Is that right? Yeah. And, and it's my right. number. And it's my number three. Um, so, so why don't, don't you start, start explaining it? Because you're the one who introduced me to Meliora. I, I introduced Patrick to Ghost, and the first time I tried to introduce Patrick to Ghost, he thought it was so stupid and gay. Well, hold and, on, uh, hold on, this is unfair, because I listened to Opus Eponymous, and I was Which like, is a great album! Yeah, and I was like, you know, this is pretty cool, I'm not hugely into it, but this is pretty cool. I like it more now, but I always thought it was pretty good, I just never got super into them. So I, I went through this, this phase, throughout, you know, late high school, mid-college, where I just thought Ghost was the shit. I saw them nine times. I met them. I'm friends with a bunch of them on Facebook. You know, I, I, I follow all their other bands. Followed. I only follow two of them now. Um, that phase has since ended. I am significantly less of a Ghost fan. But this album, I would still say, is spectacular. You know, people are saying it's not a metal record. No. It is a metal record. Well, it's, it's definitely just, a metal record. It's just a classic metal record. This could be a Judas Priest album. This could be uh, an Ozzy album. You know, it, it really feels like, you know, Ozzy Ultimate Sin era, which I, I think is great. You know, I had that album on vinyl. I love uh, old Ozzy. You know, again, it feels like Jake E. Lee era Ozzy, which is, I, I don't think anyone's calling not metal. And the, the coolest thing about it is it's deeper than that you know they've got a track like cerise which is an eight minute mid-tempo epic what the hell like that's your single but you know i, I would say the riff to cerise is heavier than a lot of things metallica is doing right now cerise is eight minutes i thought it was like six minutes whatever it's something it's it's long it's, it's long, long for a single, single that's, that's for sure, sure. um the thing, thing about ghost is they are hiding the fact that they're, they're not a guilty, guilty pleasure, pleasure. Like, they're, they sound like they're just, you know, straight up, basically pop metal. If you listen closely to them, they're doing really interesting stuff under the surface. You know, there's loads yeah. of mixture and an accidental and weird chords like that. There's loads of variation in the verses and just these subtle elements that make something which you can just sing because it's catchy. You know, it's just something... You can appreciate on like a visceral, oh, this is catchy, fun metal, whatever, right? 
But, but if you, you listen, listen really closely, closely to it, they're doing something really interesting. interesting. Even, Even the, the chorus, chorus of Cerise, for instance, instance, right? Yeah. Da, 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 well, but that's what the vocals are doing. The guitar is doing something completely different. Right, so the vocals right there, that just sounds like your normal, minor, pretty chorus. But there's mixture under it, you know? And it's actually, isn't it, isn't it like mixed meter, actually? Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's mixed the meter. guitars are doing something completely different. It's and they're sneaky, like mixed. It's sneaky in the fact that it's progressive, right? I think that the best example of, of, of Ghost is when I realized that Ghost is actually really good was uh, From the Pinnacle to the Pit. Yeah, that song just sounds like a, a mid-tempo banger, but the the guitar parts to that song are actually insanely interesting. You know, it's not just that right there. That riff sounds like you know any Black Sabbath riff, but where it gets cool is like that's yeah. insane that's really cool yeah and you know then they they also get pretty heavy on this record you know you got mummy duster they tune down to drop c and they get really heavy with it um you know spirit is a pretty proggy song it's kind of weird and has that but you know i think the actual gem of this record is deus in absentia yeah, I agree, um, and and it's 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 I don't even need to analyze it to to appreciate it. You know, I, that's always true with ghosts. You can analyze it if you want to, or you can just just this it's is like, epic. Is. This is just epic. Um, and Davis and Absentia, I don't even try to um, to to analyze it because it's just it just feels so epic. I just really and I really connect with what he's saying at at, at, at a lot of levels actually. You know. This, yeah. this idea of sometimes you just need to let go and enjoy the chaos that is life, you know? In you the just, absence of God. Yeah, in the absence of God. And, I mean, personally, I'm not living in the absence of God. You're not living in the absence of God. But that attitude of sometimes the world is just chaotic and you just need to... We are just here to revel, <laughs> you know? And Forever, the world is on fire, you know? Yeah. Another thing I want to mention about this record is there's actually a hidden track in this record that you can only get on the vinyl, and it's insanely good. Oh. It's called Zenith. If you haven't listened huh. to it, I highly recommend it. It's insane. I, I've never like, heard it, that. I guess I'll need to hear that now. Zenith is better than he is, Majesty and Absolution. Damn. Of course, I think Majesty... You think Majesty is the weakest track on, on the album. I think Absolution is the weakest track on the album. Uh, I, I think Majesty is great. I just love the chorus because it, 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 yeah. it's got so much like contour to it. And it's got that medieval vibe. Uh, it's got that deep purple vibe too. Um, that it does. Uh, but yeah, people like to shit on Ghost because it's accessible, because your girlfriend can listen to it and they can sell it at the stadium. Every girlfriend and, I've ever had has liked Ghost. <laughs> and... Because their latest album is not very good. <laughs> it, it has three good songs on it. Wrath, Life Eternal, and Witch Image. And then Witch, it's got two <laughs> Witch Image is irresistibly good. Witch Image is just so powerful. We can talk about Witch Image another time. But yeah, there's, some, there's some crazy stuff on that song. That's true. But like overall, there's so it's like hair metal. It's why are you doing this? <laughs> why are you doing this, Dust Ghost? Um... And I was so hyped up because Wrath is good. But Wrath is so good. People love to shit on Ghost, and they don't deserve it. No, they, really, they don't. They, 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 um, I mean, I understand why. It's popular, and it's popular because it's accessible. But in this case, accessible does not mean bad. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have to echo that. You know, despite my decline in interest of Ghost due to the crappiness of Prequel. You know, I, I, I think you know, Meliora and Opus Eponymous are two phenomenal records. You know, James Hetfield loves it. You know, so if he likes it, it has to be good, right? Okay, now we have to start listening to Ted Nugent, I guess. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. 
David Ellison was a ghoul for Halloween once. So, you know, there's more than one good opinion. And I love Ted Nugent. <laughs> All right. Well, in any case, let us proceed. I guess now we share the top album since yeah. you, you switched around. Um, I turned Nick onto this one. And as a Boy God fan, it's natural that I'd probably also be a Vector fan. They're progress- they don't sound that similar, but they're both progressive metal and they love sci fi. And Vector the- is significantly better than Voivod. And also, you turned me onto this record, but I found Vector first. Maybe, but we found it separately. Yes. Okay. Well, in any case, um, yeah, I, I turned on- him onto this record. Um, the hype died down. There was a lot of hype, and then it died down, but that you really shouldn't have, because this record absolutely deserved the hype. For those of you who don't know, Vector is a progressive, blackened, thrash metal band. Um, they do a lot of melodies, a lot of weird weird stuff. Like, it sounds sort of spacey, sort of sci-fi. There's a lot of things that sound... That kind of thing. Um, it's what Dream Theater wanted to be. Yeah, in a lot of ways that's true. A lot of, a lot of ways that's true. Very high-pitched, fast-paced... Lots of tremolo. They tune their guitars up. Yeah, they tune their guitars up. They just not don't, down, not up. up. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and all that's cool. And you know, normally just in itself, it would be a cool novelty. But Vector put together a hell of an album on Terminal Review. It is a concept album. Uh, which seems to be the common theme in a lot of great albums. But it's actually a sequel to their previous album. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, Outer Isolation, isolation right? Because the guy... Okay, so the guy is in some sort of isolation experiment in outer space in the previous album. And then in this album, he discovers some way to manipulate time that's kept kind of vague. I think and he, he falls into a black hole. Right, and then he uses it to take over the galaxy from the people who are oppressing him and putting him in outer isolation. He creates this sort of utopian, dystopian society where no one ages, and they can't, uh, they they don't make any more people, and they just ascend basically to the height of all life. And then, at that point, they realize, well, we have nothing left. Without death, there's nothing to make our lives real. There's nothing more we can achieve or strive for in our lives. So from that point, they just have to collapse. And so they all collapse as a society out upon realizing this. And um, ultimately, the protagonist learns acceptance of the limitations of human nature and just says, we, 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 to, we live to die. We, we have to exist to really appreciate what we are. We have to have these limitations on us. So now that's, that's a question. Um, people have actually it's a serious question if technology um, allows us to live forever should we? you know that's a serious question some people think that it's sort of naive to say oh death is just natural it's part of life when really life is what's valuable but does death really give life value or is it something that we could get rid of I'm, I'm leaning towards Vector's side that death is something important to life's value but at the same time I'm not sure if that's just a rationalization that we come up with to try to justify the sort of absurdity of death. Anyway, those are all the themes in it. Musically, it's also intense because oh, it's, it's just outstanding. It's it's just um, there's melodic moments. It's extremely technical. Uh, and there's never a dull moment. Uh, they take a lot of uh, motifs and ideas from songs and rehash them not just throughout the song. But throughout the entire album, there's a lot of things that pop up throughout the album that you can hear as like themes when a certain character enters the story or when a certain idea comes back. You can particularly hear this in the two songs, charging and recharging the void. Right, and there's a lot of color in it, you know, with yeah. the soul soul type moments and those, you know, there that that almost raga section in um, in recharging the void and the. The Cygnus Terminal also is just, you know, there's so many moments that feel, you know, almost psychedelic. Like there's a lot of, I think, psychedelic type stuff going on here and a lot of soul type stuff. And those weird chords um, mixed in with the tremolo, black metal, traditional melodies, 
progressive things, sci-fi, mystic, mystic sounding. Also, weird the number one stuff. thing I heard here in this in this uh, album is like little homages to the type of music you'd hear in fifties sci-fi. You know, like a, a lot of the the melodies and stuff here, especially in the guitars, are just black metal versions of Star Trek melodies. And let's you know, not just yeah, and then so before, okay. Let's not forget just ripping aggressive thrash because yeah, it does it's, that great. Thrash. We're talking about all this stuff, and it's still a thrash metal record. Yeah, it's still just a rip your face off thrash metal record. Um, I've ranted so much now. I'm gonna let you rant somewhat. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna go a little deeper into the the, the sci-fi motifs because you know I, I'm a, a nerd and I'm a fan of sci-fi and crap like that. So it's really cool how he manages to channel 50s sci-fi all around the the album. And the reason why that's cool and not hokey and weird is because that type of music is what we've learned to associate with space travel, the unknown and things like that. You know, that ooh type of thing. You know, that you we just hear alien when we think of that. And you know, where where we follow these great stories like the forbidden planet and stuff like that where like we're flying through space and there's just clear music that goes along with that and vector channels that perfectly while not diluting their thrash metal or black metal or progressive metal whatever the hell they're doing at that point you know so it's just amazing how they're able to to channel those emotions and without even you know, I'm going to be honest with you I can't understand a word the guy says I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't say a single lyric from that album when he was telling me the story of what the uh, the album meant that was all that was it that's all I knew well well you know uh, you can so, understand part of fall right or collapse yeah because he yeah, sings I, on that I, I, I understood the a little bit of collapse but to be honest with you I didn't even care about the story I just wanted uh, the expanse of the sound. I could just picture flying through space and going into black holes and fighting monsters in my head <laughs> because that's just what it feels like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, the guy who uh, is the mastermind of this whole thing and front man is a jackass who beats his wife, apparently. Allegedly. Or not his wife, not his wife, his, his girlfriend, allegedly. I guess. Allegedly and probably. Probably. We can't, we, you can never know for sure because I don't know the guy, so maybe he's not that, but he seems to be. One and of my favorite things is if you scroll through Power Trips pictures on Facebook, they have a, a picture of, of the guy from Vector getting arrested because he, oh, yeah, he, he threw great. beer at a cop or something like that. <laughs> and they're like, you know, you buy this guy a beer or something like that, it turns out, you know. I love the comment on that. I, I love the comment on that. It says, we do not support violence against any group. We do support more beer for our friend Dave. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what they said. <laughs> that's, that's just great. It's, it's unfortunate when someone, when, when talented people are... Um, not good people, but it happens, and you kind of just got to move on with your life. I think um, it's very common with people we listen to in particular. Yeah, I mean, especially you're a big black metal. Guy. I am I'm a big, big dissection guy. guy. You're a big we dissection both, guy. We both love Vector. We people both would, love... <laughs> a big Megadeth guy. People might say that about Dave Mustaine, however, to a significantly lesser degree. Voivod are amazing people, though. Voivod are just outstanding. Oh, go to hell, you. <laughs> they're Canadian. And Warbringer are amazing people, too. They're, they're really nice guys. Those guys are just su super nice. We hung out with them after we played at them, and you know, they were just absolutely the, the peak of nice guys. They wanted to talk. They wanted to just chat about music and guitars and stuff like that. So go see Warbringer. Yeah, go see Warbringer. Yeah, moral of the story, go see everyone on, on both of our lists. Go, go check them all out. They're all great, except for Mastodon and Gojira. Oh, fuck you. They're all good except for Boy Bob. <laughs> um, and, yeah, that's that's our top ten for this past decade. I think it's been a really good decade for metal. I think yep. it's basically, I mean, nothing's the 80s and the 90s, but I think this is basically as good as the 2000s at least. It's and, a significant step up from the 2000s, I think. Probably, yeah, probably. I, I would, I would agree with that. Uh, there's some classics from the 2000s too, but I think that yeah. it was last is an improvement. We've entered a mature phase of metal, I think, 
you know, where we're not creating new genres, we're working within the boundaries of them to create interesting things. And yeah. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that uh, there's this past decade's been great. And we I, hold on, we're totally creating new future. genres though, with like Gent and the Cores. And Gent stuff like happened that. in like that. That was in the 2000s though. There was Gent yeah, in like 2006 or something. And by then, basically, there's nothing past 2006 that people are making. Probably. Yeah. But people don't need to make new genres to innovate within, you know, the parameters that they have to make new kinds of music, uh, to make just generally great music, even if it isn't that innovative, because that's that's what a lot of Warbringer falls into. It's, it's a little innovative, it's a little interesting, but mostly it's just extremely well ex executed. Um, yeah. yeah, so I suppose that about wraps it up. Um, this has been the first edition of Dialectic Chaos, a podcast where two metal guys rant about metal and argue with each other and maybe do something else at some point we'll see <laughs> likely many tangents about canada yeah many tangents about canada <laughs> um but yeah i think we'll probably try to do this next week at around the same time is that good for you probably probably uh we'll we'll, we'll keep you posted we're going to have this on twitch i mean it is on twitch in general, but we're going to keep it up in the archives, I believe, and mm -hmm. post this to YouTube. Um, soon we should have social media on all your major platforms, Twitter, Instagram. So stick around and um, uh, we will make more content for you. I don't know what we'll do next week, but we'll, we'll, we'll have something next week. All right. We'll have something for you. It'll be good. It'll, it'll I be good. promise. I promise. Yes. All right. So uh, that about wraps it up. I am. Until next time, I'm Patrick. I am Nick. And this has been Dialectic Chaos. See ya.